Does it seem like you're becoming more and more free today? Or does it feel like the walls are closing in on your freedoms? You may be wondering, what does this have to do with business? Everything. Freedom is foundational for every business and entrepreneur. After all, it is called free enterprise. In practical terms, how we can live truly free, find joy, and even own a house with some groceries in it. In this podcast, AJ and I are going to show you how by being a business owner or entrepreneur could be your ticket to more freedom and begin pushing those walls back because entrepreneurs are the greatest force for spreading freedom, not only in our own lives, but in our worlds. In fact, if millions more of us became entrepreneurs, we could literally become an unstoppable force for freedom. George, if the walls are closing in on freedom, how can entrepreneurs succeed? Don't we need freedom to have any entrepreneurial success? That's a very interesting question. You know, I'm gonna say no. And the reason is, is because I think freedom begins in us. Um, the second you ask that, I'm just flashing back to travels that I did before another wall came down. Uh, we we're talking about the walls of freedom closing in. Well, there was the Iron Curtain, uh, the Berlin Wall. Uh, we've all heard about that, uh, read it in history books. I was actually alive in that time <laughs> and traveled in the in those countries, I traveled in Russia and met entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs in Russia. Now, I definitely wasn't alive at that time, but everything I've read from the old newspapers and uh, the old forms of media back then, it doesn't make me think there were any entrepreneurs in Russia behind the Iron Curtain. Well, you wouldn't have thought so. And, and honestly, a little cultural thing is... Our governments all create this like animosity and cold wars and all this stuff, right? But when you meet the people, you discover they're more like you. And we started running into people on the streets in the major cities like St. Petersburg, our first stop. How do you even get started with something like that? I mean, you, you land in St. Petersburg and you're just going around asking, you know, hey, are you an entrepreneur? No, th this is so fascinating. So literally, I think this was like our first full day. And so I've met this guy on the plane. We've become really fast friends. We're walking down the street. We're not with the tour group like we were supposed to be. That's a real important point. And I've got this tote umbrella in my back pocket. And it, it looks like this. So it's it's short. And I just had it and I had it on blue jeans. OK. And so I have my umbrella and I have on my blue jeans. I am an easy target. Yeah, this guy's an American. All of a sudden, I feel the umbrella come out of my back pocket. And I'm like, I turn around there's this really tall Russian guy, and he looks at me. He's tall and skinny and young. And he looks at me, he goes, how much you want for these? <laughs> it's not for sale. He goes, you Americans, you sell everything. <laughs> I, I, I got to have an umbrella, okay? He goes, oh, you can get another umbrella. How much you want? He, and, you know, he offered me some amount of money, like, say, 40 rubles. And I go, no, 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 I'm not selling it. 60, I give you 60 rubles. He's going up. He thinks I'm, de I'm bargaining with him. And I go, no, 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 it's not for sale. And he goes, you know, he's just pointing this umbrella at me. Okay, he would tell us that, you know, he was on the basketball team for the Russian Olympics. And, I, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, but, you know, <laughs> with these guys, he had a buddy. And so we codenamed them Peter and Paul because in kind of the center of the old part of St. Petersburg is the Peter Paul Fortress. And so we thought, well, that would be a good code because we don't know what their names were. You know, it's like, you know, Elitch and Vladimir or something. I don't know. <laughs> Couldn't remember. Them. And even though my friend spoke a little bit of Russian, um, we needed them to speak English. We said, let's meet later. And the, and, and one of the reasons was, it's as I recall, it, the fortress is on a little island, and it was a perfect meeting spot to meet up. And so we set a meeting time at night. Before you get to the island, what about the umbrella? Oh, 
I sold it. Um, <laughs> How much did you get? I think I probably got like 80 rubles. I mean, which I think like would have translated, except you can't do anything with rubles, but it would have been the equivalent of like over $100, you know, over $100 for this umbrella. Yeah. Oh, so you did pretty good. Yeah, if you want to say so. We meet, we meet um, Peter and Paul, as we call them. And this is absolutely fascinating. We would trade some things, you know, obviously jeans. I picked up some really cool things from Russia there with him. I, we also got more rubles, which we couldn't really spend much of. But here was the most fascinating thing about the conversation. And my friend Randy and I were talking to him, and we, and, and we were like, so we had been talking about America. They were asking us all these questions. What's it like here? And finally, we said, you know, if you could have one thing from America, that's what they called the United States. And we talked about, you know, the cars. We talked about, you know, the technology. We talked about the TVs. We talked about all this stuff, you know, the glitter, you know, the materialism things. We said, if you could just have one thing, what would it be? And without hesitation, they both said freedom. Wow. That didn't even occur to us. That freedom was the most important thing to them. That's such an interesting thing for them to ask for. Not any commodity or material thing, but this abstract concept. Because when you really think about it, I mean, freedom doesn't really guarantee you anything. Like you could get some freedom and be poor and actually be worse off, I imagine, than Peter and Paul were in Russia. Yeah. From our perspective over here, it's, it's maybe hard to relate to. But when you have no freedom and you have no choice, you'd go in the market, there'd be no food. They didn't have, they don't have supermarkets like us. I remember when we came out of the Iron Curtain and it was a cold, rainy summer night, but it was very cold. We, we came into Vienna and we come out of the train station and we take a trolley that goes through Vienna. Oh my gosh. Because we had been like over six weeks behind the Iron Curtain. Okay. <laughs> very, very long time for Americans. And the stores were just full of, it looked like Christmas morning. I mean, they, they, they were lit up. There were toy stores. There were clothing stores. There were bakeries and meat shops. And, and it, everything was just flowing in the West. And we had just come from this stark, dark place where there's nothing in the stores. You can't even imagine. I mean, there is nothing. You, you know, we have a little shortage. You know, we all complain because it run out of toilet paper in the pandemic or the hurricane or whatever. Imagine never having resupply. I mean, it's incredible. And the only way you would survive and have any kind of standard of living is trading in an underground or hidden uh, economy. And so by restricting freedom, they essentially drove their markets bare where there was no economic activity, where it was almost impossible to do business. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was impossible to do business because one, you were paid a certain amount of money and that's all you got because everybody was more or less the same. And it was all controlled by the government and everything was a centrally planned economy. So there was no creativity. There was nothing. That was Russia. Okay. We, and I, I think I mentioned this in a previous podcast at one point where I, we traveled in Poland for a couple of weeks with one of the top people in the black market. And um, this is years ago. So, you know, it's okay. Uh, but they were, trading Mercedes Benz in the underground economy. They were, they were sneaking them in, which I never really found out how they were doing it. I did ask. Uh, they were sneaking them in through Germany. And it's, I mean, they're trading whole cars. I mean, imagine a completely hidden underground car dealership. And that's not something you can hide either, because, I mean, if you buy the car in Poland, you think you'd want to drive it. So then, <laughs> Yeah, they're shipping them in by train. Now, Poland was a little bit more lax uh, than Russia at the time. 
so so they could sneak stuff through a little bit better. But I mean, it was absolutely fascinating, and and it was thriving. And so so when the Iron Curtain falls, I mean, all these Eastern European, not so much the Russia economy, but all those Eastern European countries, their their economies just took off because there was a level of of underground economy that was already happening. Now it was above ground. It got the air of freedom and it just flourished. Yeah. And the, the stats here back that up where Poland after 1989, they were seeing 700% plus GDP growth over a, a 20 year period here. Right. And all just because freedom was all the air that that entrepreneurial fire that was burning within the population. That's all they needed was a little bit more freedom. And then Poland took off. And now it's one of the most developed nations in the world. Yeah. And and, and what was on the lower end of that? Uh, Croatia, Slovenia, Bulgaria. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So those three in particular don't get the full impact of the of the Berlin Wall, the Iron Curtain coming down, because they're they're still controlled by dictators to a certain extent during that time frame. So their freedom was less, but they still doubled or tripled, right? I mean, they they just they so air, you know, all boats rise in a rising tide, but Poland at like what is that, 800 percent makes a lot of sense to me because those those were the people who were really I mean, they're more entrepreneurial than us, to be really quite honest. So just already having that entrepreneurial spirit, that automatically creates the conditions for a thriving and flourishing economy so long as you pour some freedom on it. Yeah, AJ, I truly believe that. In fact, I write to that effect in my book, The Next Level Entrepreneur. In the prologue, and you can read that on Amazon in the preview, but I want to read this one part, this one sentence, because it, it underscores that it's, it is a mentality. It's, a, it's an attitude of heart. For you see, Mr. A had concluded that, and he's the sage who's writing letters to Max, the entrepreneur. For you see, Mr. A had concluded that this could be done anywhere in the world, regardless of circumstance. And what he's talking about is entrepreneurship. He's talking about living fully into the person you're intended to be. And whether one lived in the bleakest place on earth or the most glorious or anywhere in between, it was possible to experience this greatest freedom every day. And if you really ponder Mr. A's aspiration, you may begin to realize an almost unimaginable freedom for yourself. Now, just between you guys, I've never really shared this, but the inspiration for that paragraph comes from the stories you just heard. Because in meeting these guys, Peter and Paul, and we would meet some other entrepreneurs in Russia, and meeting um, the entrepreneurs in Poland, I saw that the human spirit can flourish under any sort of circumstances, under the most tyrannical government or the most free government and that entrepreneurs push for freedom and the statistics are showing this the statistics show that those the wall came down because people wanted freedom and they had it right on the other side of the wall in in berlin in in all those countries that were divided and like in austria when we came over through the iron curtain i'll tell you more entrepreneurs, more freedom. And we all want more of that freedom in our lives. A lot of people, they might be misguided and they'll say, I just want more money. If I was just a millionaire or a billionaire, right. you know, I'd have everything I want and need and I'd be happy. But that's not really what we're looking for. You just want the freedom to be who you are. Yeah. And, and I mean, I know millionaires and at least one billionaire and these people are pinned down by their wealth. And you can read about them and you don't look, you don't need a whole lot of money to have freedom in relationships, to have freedom in pursuing the callings and missions on your life, to pursue making your world better. You don't need a lot of money doesn't give you that. 
money doesn't money helps. I mean, I'm not going to say that. And we want we want every entrepreneur and business owner to be successful, but not to the cost of like you don't know your children's names. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the most, the, the greatest intimacy you have with your child is sitting in the baseball stands as they're on the little league field. No, we want you to live truly free in every aspect of your life. And that actually begins by living as who you're intended to be, not as someone else told you to be. Like, we think you should be a doctor, Johnny, you know, and you're like, I don't want to be a doctor but daddy's a doctor. So maybe I should be a doctor. Hey. Exactly. All of American culture will tell you, you're really only as successful or you're really only as happy as, as much money you make. It's that whole meet the Joneses thing that everybody has going on all the time. And we're saying we want the freedom from that. We don't want to play the meet the Joneses game. If I can run a bakery shop and I make a hundred thousand dollars a year and I can live happily off of that, that's great. You, you have the freedom to do that. We're saying we the the pursuit of money or this idea that you have to accumulate a ton of it, that in itself is a constraint. That That isn't freedom. That is just another, that's a lie that's told to a lot of people. And when you pursue that, you trap yourself a lot of ways. I've actually met the Joneses. <laughs> um, I worked with at-risk kids for a while. And I got to see behind the front door in their lives. They would just leave a stack of hundred dollar bills on the counter and say, Johnny, mom and I are headed out for the weekend. Y'all don't do anything bad. Here's some money. Take care. What? What? What is? And that's what money sometimes turns out to be. And, and it's so disconnected from reality and it creates at risk kids. I'll just tell you. <laughs> yeah, and that's a, a great point because if you follow that lie of you're only as successful as as much money you have, now not only have you trapped yourself and stopped yourself from pursuing freedom, in a lot of ways you've trapped your kids and are hindering their ability to pursue freedom. Yeah, and and honestly, my gosh, I I can't I've really not seen a successful transfer of wealth between generations. Um and, and it's tricky. I mean, it, it obviously happens and some people do it very, very well, but I will just tell you, it is really, really tricky. And so even though we're talking about all of that, I am going to encourage you to one, if you're not an entrepreneur, start thinking entrepreneurially, start looking at things that you could actually have a love doing, a passion to do that you can make money at and start it as a side hustle because you want to start getting some freedom. You want to start getting some space. You want to be able to run your own life. And eventually that could become a full-time gig. The, the idea is you can control how much money you make. You don't, you know, in some jobs, you just forced up the ladder to keep making more money and keep pouring in more time. And you might, I'll bet you anything. If you're after freedom, you're going to want more time than more money. You need enough money. But then at some point you can go, okay, I want more time too. And you have that choice as an entrepreneur. Imagine one of those survivor shows with a different twist. Instead of 16 contestants and teams, there are 102 people and no teams. A small boat drops them off on a landmass far away from where they live. The boat leaves, they're going to be there for years. And they can only survive by living off the land and what they bring on the boat. So how do they survive? By the way, this is a true story. In this podcast, we're going to tell you what happened to those people, because understanding this will help you build wealth and live into more freedom. Plus, it will create a thriving economy. But first, you need to understand what doesn't work based on actual facts and history. That's right. And you want to know who those 102 people were? Well, they were actually the pilgrims traveling on the Mayflower in 1620 to the New World. And as Professor Richard Ebling said, they were not only escaping religious persecution, but they also wanted to turn their back on what they viewed as the materialistic and greedy corruption of the old world. Yes. And what I found fascinating about their whole story was they, they started out as a collective utopia, and it was based on Plato's Republic and the communist ideas in it. 
wait, Plato was a communist? Well, it's not like a Bolshevik communist. <laughs> he was he so okay, so what does communism mean? Communism is living in a commune, communal living, um and sharing everything in common. And the communism takes it to equal outcomes for all. And and then you get, I, I honestly didn't know this was in Plato's Republic. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think the Bolsheviks came up with it, but their, their deal was they forced everybody to be a communist. So that's where it took the shift, became tyrannical. Okay, so Plato was more ideal in thinking that everybody would just cooperate and willingly want to be part of this communist utopia. Yeah, yeah, because and, and look, the pilgrims are there too, because they, they read some things in the Bible and and actually in the Bible, uh, in the New Testament, there's a failed community experience that happens in the early church. So this has never worked. <laughs> But they wanted to try. They it was all ideal, and they were reacting to the old world. And they, you know, yeah. And I could see how it would never work. I mean, if I was one of those 102 pilgrims, and I was escaping the old world, and was gonna land in America with nothing but opportunity ahead of me, I wouldn't want all of my work just to go to the collective. I would think I have a, a chance to build something for myself, and especially if we're doing this communal like eating thing where. I mean, I know I eat a lot, so I would be out there hunting extra to make sure I get what I want. But if I have to give that to everybody else first, that would just that would just drive me insane. And I, I wouldn't want to participate. Uh, OK, AJ, hang on. Wait a minute. So you're coming from a 2024 independent American uh, Texas transplant. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and look, that affects our worldview. Because these guys were not Americans yet. They they came over from the old world and they had old world values. And they were honestly, first and foremost, escaping religious persecution, just getting out of there. So the the idea that, you know, they were idealistic. So it's like, yeah, I'm hungry and I eat a lot of food, but, you know, I need to share this with everybody. Yeah. And in the article... Eberling was actually saying that the women felt like slaves working in this utopia or dystopia in their eyes. Yeah, I can understand. Okay, we're collectivists. We're going to try this. That sort of thing. They did it for two years. People are dying from starvation. Bradford writes something to the effect of, hey, we better come up with a better plan because we're all dying. And so he and the elder guys, I'm, I'm like, how many people are left? Like three, you know? <laughs> They decide, I'm exaggerating, but they decide, hey, let's give everybody their own piece of property to raise their own food. Yeah, I mean, I would have probably proposed something like this after the first person died. Like, hey, we're not making enough food here. We need to, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna go over to this neck of the woods and I'll uh, take care of myself and y'all can keep on trying whatever this is. Yeah, yeah. You would have been the like a time transport guy from 2024 back into there. He actually writes, and so assigned to every family a parcel of land according to the proportion of their number. So in other words, if you had a family of four, then you got a certain size. And if you had a family of eight, you got a larger size, right? And then he writes, this had very good success for it made all hands very industrious. So the fascinating thing is the women, and I'm sure it was men too, who felt like slaves were now doing the exact same work, but they didn't feel like slaves anymore because they owned the property and the results were theirs. Yeah, they could see their kids eating the food that they just went and picked. Yeah, and he says that. He writes, the women went willingly into the field, which before would allege weakness and inability, whom to have compelled would have been thought great tyranny and oppression. In other words, that's what the Bolsheviks did do. So they they were not going to go become Bolsheviks, all right, and force everybody to go, you know, raise potatoes like they did. But that he but he could figure that out. He goes like before we had to make everybody do it or they didn't do it. And that was their problem. Not everybody was helping. And so they were starving. The fascinating thing here is that when they went to this new individual property rights approach, 
they had more food than they knew what to do with. And there was an abundance of food that they could share with everybody. And that's the invisible hand that Adam Smith will talk about about a hundred years later. Where what you're referring to is Adam Smith, the father of economics, who wrote the uh, the Wealth of Nations in 1776. And in this, he's talking about economic systems, and he describes this metaphor of the invisible hand that you just talked about. And that's just this term for the self-regulating nature of markets and how they just naturally create positive social outcomes when there's a competitive environment. And all of his work, I mean, they call him the father of economics, all of his work laid the foundation for all economic thinking, I mean, up to modern day. Yeah, AJ, the thing about Adam Smith is he's talking about pure free markets. And I think it's helpful to understand what that is because we don't have that. So he's like talking free from government interference, free from corruption, you know, freedom from all kinds of things. And that if you let free markets just work on their own, then they're going to self-regulate. Yeah. And that's because there's an economic incentive to do so. If you right. are, if you're in any way presenting an inferior product or service, then customers are going to go somewhere else and you're going to feel the economic hits from that and you're going to have to update your product or service to make it better and all of this being done without anybody forcing you to just the fact that you want to survive is enough to force you to improve your product or service and therefore improve the society you're offering it to yeah exactly so if you produce a pesticide that causes cancer theoretically under Adam Smith, that people would stop buying it. Well, actually it was supported by the government. So they were funded and they could keep thriving. And so, but it's starting, to, even though that happened, people started suing those companies. And now the, the piles of billions of dollars of lawsuits that they owe you know, is maybe starting to influence and maybe we shouldn't make as much of this anymore. Well, exactly what you said, they're able to get away with it because the government's funding them. Yeah, so what, what Adam Smith is actually saying would actually work because if people are dying from your product or children are swallowing small things from your product or whatever, people are going to stop buying that real quick. I mean, real quick. And you don't have to have some regulations good, but you don't have to have the level of what we have now. And I, here's, the, here's the key point here, is this invisible hand works. And even, even today, it works. Right, AJ? Exactly. Uh, I mean, you just um, another modern example is Boeing, right? They have two astronauts stuck in space because they, they're a failure of a company. They've got. I, I, I saw a great headline. This is the longest flight delay in history. <laughs> it's going to be eight months at least. Yeah. And that's after having a door fly off of a plane. They've had landing gear fly off, wheels fly off, wings are losing pieces. Like all of this by a company that's heavily, heavily, heavily subsidized by the government. So on the invisible hand, the stock is at all time lows. They're one of their one of their main competitors, Lockheed Martin's hitting all time highs. And now they're having to concede, well, we're going to have to have another space company go up there and get those astronauts. <laughs> this is the, it, it's weird, but Adam Smith is still right. Yeah. And it, it seems as if all of the, the, the layers of government involvement here, whether it's in the, the chemicals they're putting on food or in getting astronauts out of space, it seems like all of this government involvement has actually just slowed down the net, the, the invisible hand here where Monsanto was able to spray your stuff right. for 40 years without anybody knowing about it. And now they start to know about it. And then it's even a slower process for people to just say, wait, we're not going to eat stuff that was sprayed with that. And now in the case of planes, I don't know how long it's going to take us to get another airline manufacturer. Right. Well, or, or they respond to the market. 
and they stop making planes where the doors fall off. I mean, it's kind of a simple solution, right? In other words, what they've done is they've gone in and they've cut costs so hard so they have bigger margins so that their stock price would go up. But in reality, what they did has caused their price to go down. So this is, guys, what we're showing here is that this is real important to understand. But there's another thing going on. And I saw this quote from Justice Gorsuch, and he said, there's so many federal laws on the books that every American over the age of 18 commits one felony a day. 1970 to the present, we've seen maybe a doubling of the number of federal crimes on the books, not committed, just laws. So we're overlawed, we're overregulated, and it's, it's having a huge effect on us. That's terrifying to think about, that just by waking up in America, supposedly the land of the free, the freest country ever, you're probably going to commit a crime on that day, one that could, a felony at that. And at the same time that you as a normal citizen can have that amount of legal scrutiny on you at all times, companies like Boeing have gone decades and decades of cutting corners and now are only getting any scrutiny once the doors are literally flying off of their planes. And even then, you still don't see people going to jail. You have all these whistleblower stories, and I don't know where the whistleblowers have gone. I can only speculate, but no one's facing any criminal charges for that at the moment. Yeah, and Adam Smith kind of foresaw what we're talking about because he said monopoly is a great enemy because the only way good management can be universally established is through free and universal competition, which forces everyone to have recourse. And what he means by good management is everything's being done well. It doesn't, he's not talking about like management versus leadership or anything like that. He's just talking about, about that everything functions well and it's done well. There's integrity, there's honesty. But when you start having corruption between big government, big business, big tech, big whatever, yeah, you got a problem. And But it's fascinating to me, the invisible hand still works. Exactly. Good management in that you don't take employees off of ins- or field inspections because they found too many issues. Right. <laughs> You just can't let it go, can you, AJ? <laughs> no, I, the more I read about this story, the more I'm just like in awe of how this has gotten to where it is. But uh, guys, he is so wound up on this. And we've had side conversations that we didn't record. So y'all have gotten the short version of AJ on this one. It's yeah, pretty- George has edited me as best he can here. <laughs> so, so AJ, head into the media companies, because that's another one. Oh, my gosh. We're going to try to keep this short, guys. <laughs> yeah. Oh, another one of my, uh, my favorite enemies. Um, and, but I do think media is the perfect example for how the invisible hand works, because we're seeing it in real time in front of our eyes. And it's been one of the most fascinating things for me to watch over my lifetime, especially as I've become more aware of things. Because from my understanding, George, when you were growing up, there were only like six channels, right? No, AJ, there were three. (laughs) (laughs) ABC, NBC, and CBS. And we had no idea. Well, I, I wasn't, I was too young to tune into the news then. But But looking back on it and listening to like my parents, for example, I can assure you, no one had the idea that they were, it was like the Soviet Union Pravda, which was like, you know, the mouthpiece of the government. We had no idea that was the exact same thing going on in America. We thought we were the home of the brave, you know, and the free brain, I don't know, free range chickens. I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, you were you were all getting your news from the same like three billionaires, <laughs> right? Right. Well, they didn't have billionaires back then. Um, it, it, that would be an inflation years. thing that would happen later. <laughs> <laughs> then cable comes in, okay, and that started opening up a few more news channels because Ted Turner would launch CNN. You know, eventually Fox would follow. So you ended up with several bigger ones, but it was all saying the same thing. Got it. Yeah, they were all saying the same thing. It was all the same news cycle. They were just covering the same stories from different angles and um, packaging it maybe a little bit different, but it still wasn't that substantive. And then even when you go to like the business channels, 
you would think, you know, oh, this is the business channel. They're going to be a little more detailed. They'll give you more information. It's not going to be just the headlines and the talking points that they have on the main news channels. Yeah, now you're swerving into my lane because <laughs> I, the, the financial advice, the business advice is terrible. It, it's just, it's, it's such a high level on that. Yeah. There's literally a reverse Kramer ETF where people do the exact opposite of what Jim Kramer does on, uh, what is he, CNBC? Um, yeah. And it, it's profitable. It's in the green. I bet you've made, I bet, I bet they're making millionaires. He is <laughs> wrong on everything. And, and But how, how does it, how do you fail upwards? I mean, we've got that all over this country. Yeah, and, but that's how that's their business model is it's failing upwards. And that's how they're not delivering the content that we as small business owners actually need to hear. They're only delivering the content that their big business, big donors, um, their advertisers want them to deliver, which is basically giving the corporate line. Right. OK, so, guys, so this isn't just a rant. Where we're going is we want to show you how the invisible hand works and how it can work for you. So 17 years ago, YouTube started. And then about five to 10 years ago, you start seeing business channels, okay? And they're small. And I didn't watch them at that time or know anything about them. But now they're big ones. And these guys, they're what they're telling you is not actionable. It's not going to help you grow. Oh, yeah, you're not going to make $62,347 an hour or whatever they're promising, okay? So we want to disrupt that. So we've got a tiny channel, all right? This is your tiny business, your side hustle. We can disrupt, and that's what's happened. There's no longer three channels. There's 3,000 channels because of YouTube, and, and it's disrupting. We're a tiny channel. Like and subscribe, okay? Uh, but we want to disrupt with actionable, practical advice you can use to grow your business. And you cannot follow what you think everybody else is doing. You've got to follow what your passions are. You've got to follow what you see as an opportunity that nobody else really gets. Exactly. And as this internet opportunity has opened up, you can see all the valuation of these major media companies just tanking. And that's right. because they don't know how to compete. Once the the marketplace went from a market that they completely control with those three channels in George's childhood to introducing the cable bundle. And they had a few more ch channels, but they still controlled the medium to now with YouTube and the internet, they can't control the medium. And so there's an unlimited number of channels and unlimited number of voices, and they actually have to compete against those, which they haven't had to do for the entirety of their business existence. And I, don't think they'll be able to adapt to. And and you see this in other industries. You see this in the restaurant industry. There's new restaurants starting all the time. There's there's old restaurants folding all the time. You see you see consolidators trying to come in and consolidate stuff. You see it not working. You see it working. This is the invisible hand. And the more entrepreneurs, the more we do this, the more disruptive it gets. We start pushing against the regulations. We start pushing against the laws. And in the, the free enterprise, just like that happened behind the Iron Curtain, brought the Iron Curtain down. It'll bring down regulation. And so what I think you've got to do is pick your area. What's happening in media is that can be happening in any industry. I promise. So what we're saying is get something entrepreneurial started. The only way to change the state of the marketplace, if you're concerned about it, is to get in there and to compete and try to make it better on your own. That's exactly what me and George are doing. We're concerned about the state of media. We're concerned about the business environment for entrepreneurs and for small business owners. And so how are we combating that? We're getting in the field and we're trying to bring our voices to the space and we're trying to compete and we're trying to give entrepreneurs content that they won't hear anywhere else. Well, and to be honest there, AJ, to quote that great philosopher Yoda, you must unlearn what you have learned. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try.
<laughs> we are doing it, guys. Go back and look at our content. We're getting better at it. But listen, it's about it's guidance. It's it's based in real world, real time experience. And it's not fluff. It you could you can take this content and make money at it. Come to my free masterclass on Zoom once a month. It's at getbusinesssavvy.com. We have stuff that's going to really help you. Are we going to disrupt? That's our plan. That's our objective. And you can do the same thing in whatever your passion is that you can make money at. Start it off as a side hustle. And I'm not talking about the hustle culture. That's another we don't even get us started. Um, <laughs> but but seriously, it just start a little side hustle and and experiment with with no risk because it's going to take some time. It's going to take some work. But overall, long term, it will lead to more freedoms than you could ever imagine. Today, I feel like the American dream is completely out of reach. And I know I'm not the only one. You can see it everywhere you look. Home prices are up 47% in the last four years. Grocery prices are up 26% in the same time. Marriage is declining. Happiness is declining. And even birth rates are declining. Everything seems to be going in the wrong direction. It can feel hopeless and downright depressing. But what if I told you you can be free to be rich in relationships, living, and having wealth? We're going to show you how we can all have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By the way, that's from the opening of the Declaration of Independence. It reads like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In practical terms, how we can live truly free find joy, and even own a house with some groceries in it. George, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness sound like the course materials they give you for adulting 101. I thought those were just, you know, unalienable rights in the most industrialized country in the world, which is America. Well, I got news for you. It's not. Every generation has got to fight for their freedoms or they're going to lose them. I mean, you just look across history. And that's been the story. But I don't want to have to fight for my freedoms, George. I, th I thought they did that in 1776, and now I get to inherit all the, the winnings of that. Well, yeah, um, not exactly. And that's not the way humanity works. Let me read you this quote. I think it'll help. The end of democracy and the defeat of the American Revolution will occur when government falls into the hands of lending institutions and moneyed in corporations. What does that sound like? Sounds a lot like today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. You know who said that? The same guy that wrote the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson. And he also said this, I hold it that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing. And as necessary in the political world as storms in the physical. So what he means is, is like just like thunderstorms or hurricanes and tornadoes happen in the physical realm and they rejuvenate and, you know, the land and all of that. So a little rebellion in the political and I'd expand that to the business world, that sort of thing, the economy. That's good. It kind of keeps things fresh. Yeah, that sounds nice and all, George, but a rebellion is such a big thing. How, how do you even start that or contribute to it? Well, okay, he said a little rebellion. He's not thinking, you know, pitchforks and axes and we go burn the castle down. It's It could look like this, unleashing millions and millions more entrepreneurs. And then when they start encountering all these stupid regulations and laws that don't serve anybody's purpose except fulfilling some bureaucrat's dream, they start pushing back. And it's a good thing. And that's what that's what freedom does. And freedom entrepreneurs, to me, are the keeper of freedom, honestly, because it's independent thinking. We're looking for a better way to do things. And that's been proven over the centuries in the United States. The most prolific advancements in science, technology, medicine, you just name it. And it's here. So what you're saying is that to 
be an entrepreneur is to be a rebel? Yeah, I had. That's an interesting way to phrase it, AJ. I hadn't really thought about entrepreneurs as rebels. But you know what? I think you're right. Because what I, the word I use is disruptor. Well, how's that any different than a rebel? You know, we see a better way to do things, we see something missing in the marketplace. We see, get business savvy, bad business information out there. We want to disrupt the business information world with actionable guidance that you can use to go have exponential growth and live truly free and have free time and build wealth. Yeah, we don't want to be one of those fluffy YouTube channels that's just all clickbait and get rich quick schemes that you figure out don't make you rich and you can figure it out pretty quick. Um, we actually want to give substantive advice. Yeah, because we want to legitimately help everyone who tunes into our channel increase their business IQ. That's what business savvy is. And the smarter you are with that, the less you've got to deal with it, you can lead your business and grow your company. And, and so we want everyone to start a side hustle. I mean, find something you love that you can make some money at and start doing it. I will tell you, that's how I got started doing what I'm doing today. I've led like 19 companies. I've guided tons of entrepreneurs and it all started as a part-time, that's what we called it back then, side hustle, leading a small construction company. And I discovered my passion. I got, I built experience, I built skill, and I discovered I can make money at this. And when I was making money, the companies I was leading were making even more money. And so now today, we've launched a YouTube channel. You see what I'm saying? Just get started. You don't know where it's going to take you. Yeah, George, that's what I want. I want to be an entrepreneur, living freely, pursuing happiness. But like I said at the beginning, it just feels so difficult and if not impossible to do now, just like looking at the finances for it, most Americans can't even afford a sudden expense right now. Everyone's savings rates going down. Like I said, grocery prices are up 26 percent. Home prices are up 47 percent. I know my personal balance sheet is getting crunched. My family's income statements are getting crunched. Like it just feels like the math doesn't work anymore to to pursue happiness and to be an entrepreneur and to live freely. No, I get it. I get it. Um, I've got a few years on you, AJ. I've been around the block some. I can remember like there was an oil crunch or crisis. I don't even know what. I think the whole thing was made up. They literally told us like by some year we would be completely out of oil. And that year has all we've already, I can't remember what it was now, but we've, we've passed that year. <laughs> we've got, we've had oil gluts after that prediction. You know, they're saying the whole world is going to come to an end next week or in 10 years with the go global climate crisis. And they don't know none of these. If you go back, do this for fun. You go back and look at the predictions like in the fifties and what they predicted, you know, cars like the Jetsons flying through the sky and stuff like They don't know. <laughs> so if you live your life with that sort of doom and gloom, you become like Eeyore. It's good to be home. Oh, I suppose so. Weather's too nice. But George, how could you not be Eeyore in, in, in today's society? There's just such a, a malaise everywhere you go. You don't see happy people out in the street. It just feels like no one cares about anything anymore. Like people are almost resigning from the cycle of life. I mean, at work, one of the biggest complaints about my generation is that we don't have ambition, that we don't want to rise up the ladder. But you look at that in the context of the fact that it just feels like there's no direction as a, as a country at all. You know, it, my whole life, there's been red people in charge and there's been blue people in charge, but things just keep getting worse and the taxes just keep going up. It doesn't make any sense. And then I think about like, when am I going to be able to retire? Because I can't start accumulating wealth. I'm not quite accumulating wealth yet. And then also I look at the generation behind me and I think those kids are going to be absolutely useless. I don't know what they're learning with the TikTok education and the iPads. It just all feels like we're trapped in this doom cycle that we can't get out of.
Well, Christopher Robin. Okay, let me cut through this. Oh, you forgot to mention the purple people, too. Um, <laughs> they haven't been in charge. Red, blue, purple. Okay, look, it's all a lie. And, and let me go back to So I tell some stories about, about Russia. And, and so when you met people that y- you kind of had to break through and get, get beneath the surface. In fact, there, you had to get behind closed doors. And we actually got invited into people's apartments and things like that. I will tell you what makes people come alive. It isn't government policies. It isn't the economy. People have been happy for generations, for millennia, and it has nothing to do with who's the tyrant in control. It has to do with who you are, knowing your identity, and living into the fullness of the human being you're supposed to be in this given time. Period. That's it. So what you're saying... Just deal with it. (laughs) So what you're saying is... I should focus a little bit less on everything that's going on around me. Just like you said, just deal with it and focus more on becoming or and focus more on developing and living into my passions and who I actually am. Absolutely. And here's what we know. We know this fact that that the Internet. And so all the social media sources, all of that kind of stuff in comparison to other people's lives leads to greater depression. And we know that psychological drugs are up. There's more psychotherapists than there've ever been in the history of the United States, and they can't meet the demand. And there's more drugs than ever before. And I think the most telling sign of the mental health decline is the fact that you see those cyber trucks on the street now. I mean, I, I'm in Austin, Texas, so I see a lot of them. And it, I, I just can't believe that people spend that much money for that dumpster. It Okay. All right. So we're going to go on a rant here. But <laughs> I was behind one the other day, and I was, like, getting so angry. <laughs> it just made me furious. I'm like, what is it? It is so ugly. It is so ugly. And I'm like, is this some sort of stealth plane or something? I mean, what is the deal here? Exactly. Those things just cause a physical reaction in both of us. Right when you see them, they just make you so mad. But I'm seeing how if I was focusing on other things, maybe that wouldn't bother me as much. Yeah, this is where the side hustle in your passion is so powerful. So, AJ, uh, what you guys don't know is like AJ and I are – You know, we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes on YouTube and really working to make this channel the right channel for you guys. And to do that, we're investing a lot of time in like learning things, taking some e-courses, all that kind of stuff. When you start pouring yourself into something you want to do and you start learning more about it to get more skill, more experience, you don't have time for all the chatter out there, all the depressing news, all the depressing social media posts and all that kind of stuff, because you're engulfed in something you're getting excited about. Is that is that connecting? Yeah. So by starting your own rebellion or disruption and being an entrepreneur, you are rebelling against and disrupting your own life in this cycle of just negativity that we can wrap ourselves into. Yeah. As you say that, it's just occurring to me, how many hours a week do you spend looking at all this stuff? Or like, and AJ and I have talked about this, we'll go to sports stuff, college football in particular, and as a way of distraction. So either I'm enmeshed in it or I'm trying to get into stuff that's a distraction. What if I took all those hours and I started a side hustle to make more money, to find something I love that maybe could turn into my full-time gig. Is that a word uh, that people use? Um, But to become full-time and not have a boss. Oh, the freedom. (laughs) Do you see? And it's fun. Meanwhile, everyone else is doom and gloom, Eeyore's, popping a bunch of pills, seeing their therapist, and I'm living life. (laughs) 
Yeah, that does sound like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is. So, guys, don't forget, come to our free monthly Get Business Savvy Mastermind. You can ask me any questions. It's live. It's on Zoom. And we have a great time. And we'll talk about this stuff. We'll help you figure something out. We'll ideate on it. It'll be great. Just click the link in the description below or go to GetBusinessSavvy.com. And check out this episode right here. I know you're going to love it. And in the meantime, may you live truly free.